Hello, this is the Fiction Nonfiction Podcast from Literary Hub, where we believe that every issue in your Twitter feed or on the evening news has already been tackled somewhere in literature. I'm Whitney Terrell, the author of the novel, The Good Lieutenant. I'm Vivi ganesh Anandan, also known as Sugi, author of the novel, Love Marriage. So this is our episode about solitude and sociability in the age of COVID-19. We took a poll, or rather the the students who know how to make a poll on Twitter, which I don't, uh, took a poll of our, our, our listeners who assumed, uh, 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 asking our listeners who, which of the two of us was the most sociable? Who do you think won? I did in a landslide. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand where people get this idea that I am not friendly or sociable. That's, I, I got drunk a lot with people in college. I don't see why I don't get any credit for that. You were the editor of the school paper. You're kind of assuming those things are opposed, which they're really not, Whitney. But at any rate, 75% of our listeners think I'm more sociable. It is an outrage. However, we are both lucky that the poll did not include our guest for the second half of the show, Candace Bushnell, because she would have killed us. Candace's Sex in the City column and book were the basis for the famed HBO series of the same name, and she's going to talk to us about what New York social life looks like, or if it even exists at all, in the age of COVID-19. But first, we're going to talk to David Means about a topic that is clearly near and dear to your heart, Whitney, solitude. <laughs> well, it is now, apparently. Well, you have plenty of company these days because we're all learning a lot about solitude during the coronavirus pandemic. And we're going to talk to David about that and the role solitude plays in his work and in American art generally. David Means is the author of Assorted Fire Events, which won the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for Fiction and was nominated for the National Book Critics Circle Award, The Secret Goldfish, and The Spot, which was selected a 2010 notable book by the NYT. He's also the winner of an O. Henry Prize. His novel, Histopia, was longlisted for the Man Booker, and his stories have appeared in The New Yorker, Harper's, and Best American Short Stories. He's here to talk to us about his excellent story collection, Instructions for a Funeral, which just came out in paperback. David, welcome to the show. Hey, how are you? It's a thrill to get to talk to you. I've been a fan of your work for a very long time. Uh, I would always get excited when there was a new David Mean story in Harper's, for, I associate with that magazine particularly. But... Uh, Instructions for a Funeral opens with an epigraph from William Carlos Williams, which mentions, quote, that eternal moment in which we alone live, unquote. I assume that there, that's there because that solitary moment is something you try to access or express in your work? Yeah, I think it's, you know, I, I, I don't want to hedge my bets here and say it's, it's, it's a hard thing to talk about. Um, but absolutely, I think I tend to go out there and the stories that I find when I'm imagining things are about isolated people in, in certain predicaments, you know, and uh, they're usually alone somewhere or with another person and alone or alone with their own emotional turmoil. <laughs> the best company, right? Um, exactly. So I think it's not just stay-at-home orders that are making us think about solitude and isolation during the pandemic. I mean, William Carlos Williams was a doctor, and as a doctor, he also wrote really well about and had firsthand knowledge of death. And given yeah. that more than, at this point, you know, 61,000 people have died from COVID-19 in the United States, I think people are thinking about death and the solitude of death more than usual. Yeah, it's, it's, it's you know, I, I was thinking quarantine is a different kind of solitude. It's not the same as the kind of solitude that you you go out and seek and find and then you're 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 going to sort of counterpoint that solitude with going out to dinner or maybe in a week you're going to have it a wedding or something this is a totally different kind of solitude that we're in right now um i think i think that we're you know with all the death around us i mean i live sort of in one of the red hot centers here not too far from new york um it, I, I like to think that it's reminding us of death in a good way and, and reminding us that we have a narrative, that we're living a story that's, that's going to end. And, you know, as soon as you know that, as soon as you're aware that your life is going to end, you start to think of your life in narrative terms. What have I done? What have, who have I talked to? Who haven't I talked to? And then you start to think, um, how long am I going to live? Am I going to live hopefully a long time, but, you know, this is sort of reawakening some internal narrative that we all have. 
So it's sort of like at the end of a, 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 is it a good man is hard to find where the misfit says like she would have been a good woman if there had been somebody there to shoot her all the time or something? Is that the yeah, right every story? day, every, okay. every day of her life, something like that. Yeah, because he, he's sort of saying, um, you know, people live their entire lives without being alive. And, and death isn't a thing. It's, it's a force that, that reminds us how to be alive. I think that's, that's part of what he's saying at the end of that story. Well, I mean, you talk about this in the very beginning of Instructions for a Funeral, uh, where you talk about that, the void of eternity, you know, and it sort of seems to, to me like in, in that essay, Confessions, that opens the book, you're talking about like the need to sort of push back against that is one of the reasons that you write stories in the first, or at least an awareness of that void that w- awaits all of us is a reason that you want to write stories in the first place. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, I mean, I don't want to get corny about it. I think you, you're, you're writing a story, you're trying to lay claim to a narrative, you're trying to um, make something that's going to obviously last maybe, and I think I say in that little essay, maybe it'll last 100 years, maybe a week, whatever. Um, but there, there has to be this sense when you're writing a story that you're trying to catch something that can't, that if you don't catch it, it won't be caught. If you don't tell the story, it'll disappear into the void where all the other stories go that aren't told. So you, for me, at least personally, I feel like I have to feel this certain feeling of desperation that I got to I gotta capture that story. Um, and if I don't do it, it's never going to get told. But And that ties in with the, um, the awareness of, you know, the fact that all stories terminate, all stories end. I think um, what you were saying before about being alive and this reminding us of death, I was thinking about an essay that Jimmy Kincaid published on the Paris Review Daily yesterday. I just want to read a little snippet of it Um, because what you said reminded me so strongly of the line that struck me the most as I read it. Um, I am alive in the time of the dead, the time of the dead being the time in which to be alive is a form of being dead. We are dead right now for we cannot be all our ways that are ways of being alive that is familiar. And this is, I mean, sort of her pandemic, this is her pandemic take. And I was like, oh God. Wow. (laughs) And then, you know, I went from that to reading and then I was reading your work and I was like, whoa. Um, And yeah, I mean, that, that felt so much um, that like being alone with your, being alone with your own emotions and speaking of the dead, you know, we were also, of course, uh, when we research, I guess we like to look at their Instagram accounts and yours tells me that you've been hanging out at a cemetery and that it is the cemetery with Edward Hopper's grave. And he is of course, almost synonymous with that vein of American art that contemplates solitude and aloneness. And it's not just in, you know, everyone knows Nighthawks, but it's not just in that painting. It's really in, I think, everything he did. And I'm assuming yeah. you're a Hopper fan. I am. I am. Yeah, I go up to the cemetery. I, I, one thing I wanted to add, I have my next door neighbor right not too far from me right now, you know, just maybe 50 yards away is a nurse. He's a nurse at the emergency room at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in the city. So he goes in and out and deals with this incredible trauma and I talked to him a little bit but I I hike up to this Oak Hill Cemetery that's not too far from my house and Edward Hopper's buried there, Carson McCullers is there, um, C. Wright Mills is there and you know when I'm up there there's a really nice little spot it's sort of a little memorial to uh, Civil War soldiers I guess and I just sit there with a book and no one's up there no one wants to be near a cemetery. It's actually right above. It's on this beautiful hill that looks over the Hudson. And it's right above the hospital. So bo- down below is the hospital where all, all the ambulances are coming in and out. And, you know, when I go up there, I, I walk and think. And I was thinking how, like, visiting the dead is not a morbid thing. You know, thinking about the dead is not a, it's not a morbid thing. It's not a bad thing. You know, it's not like I'm some kind of horrifically morbid person. And when I go up there, I finally feel like myself, you know, I haven't felt like myself much, you know, you know what I mean? That feeling when you go out and you're, you're like somewhere away from home and you put on a certain coat and you put on a certain hat or whatever, and you feel like you're actually an interesting person or something. (laughs) And when I'm up there, when I'm up there, I feel like, I feel like, okay, I'm okay, you know, um, so is it that particular cemetery or do you, do you feel that way? I mean, I like 
I like cemeteries. That's going to sound morbid, but I mean, I think I find, you know, I, um, when I lived in uh, Cambridge, I used to go to the Mount Auburn Cemetery where there are also a lot of famous yeah. folks buried. And I find that space to be extremely comforting. Is it, yeah. Is it, yeah. Do you have others that you? I don't, you know, this one's near my house. And, right. And it's actually, and actually because it's on this steep hill and I get up there and I can almost see New York City, you know, it's like way down, it's down the river about 24 miles, but um yeah, but I still like cemeteries too. They're kind of like, I was thinking they're kind of like the internet, the early uh, manifestation of, of sort of Facebook or something, you know, they're demarking lives that were lived. Speaking of uh, solitude and artists who are interested in solitude, you have this amazing story in your collection that posits a connection between two artists, Raymond Carver and Kurt Cobain, who I associate with solitude and loneliness. And I wonder if you could read to us the, the beginning of that piece. Sure. Carver and Carver and Cobain. A few years ago, I drafted two linked stories, one about Kurt Cobain and the other about Raymond Carver. Both grew up in the Pacific Northwest. Both had fathers who worked at a sawmill. Both were, in one way or another, working class kids. There was another overlap that I struggled to show, but which was much deeper and had to do with the fact that both struggled with addiction, Carver with drinking, Cobain with heroin. Cobain in a hotel room that seemed straight out of one of, Ray of Raymond Carver's stories, at least in theory, the details being somewhat fuzzy. The stories sat in a folder and waited for a revision, and I vowed to go back to them together, united. I met Carver one time when he was giving a reading for Penn on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. I told him how much his work meant to me, and he thanked me and gave me a nod and a sidelong look he was smoking, I think, and he took the cigarette out of his mouth and tapped it on into the ashtray and then looked past me over my shoulder. And I moved to the side and let the next admirer step up. Cobain was around 19 when that moment transpired. That must have been sometime around 1986. I imagine Cobain, lonely in a good way, with the smell of pine sap in the air, listening to records and making sketches in his sketchbook unaware that he and his mother were living inside a Carver story. Perhaps that's a stretch. I would have explained to Carver, if I could have, that when I bought the book of stories, what we talk about when we talk about love, I began to read and was stunned to recognize the landscape, to see that world I knew could exist in the world of fiction. In Michigan, my neighbor, Mr. Bycroft, now dead, had worked at a, the paper mill the Bryant Mill, just down the hill to the east of my house. He was an electrician in the mill, and he came home in overalls, name patch, tool belt, black lunch pail, the works, and, drunk, and drank by himself on the front porch of his house. And in the night, usually late from my window, I heard him singing to himself, sing songs, slurred chants, and then on some occasions, he gave out a kind of howl or began shouting at his wife, and I heard then, but didn't know I was hearing, something that I would hear years later in Cobain's voice, somewhere around the edge of his singing, pushing as hard as he could to the very edge of a scream, yet still somehow, for me at least, stark and brutally clear and well wrought. Well, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, that story and your, your post about Ho Hopper, you know, made me think about the role that solitude's played in American art generally. Um, I thought of Grant Wood or Ansel Adams, Georgia O'Keeffe. You know, and in writing there's Thoreau or Annie Dillard or Ralph Ellison, because I, I think of Invisible Man as kind of a book about solitude. And I was trying to think of what connected these people. And in the end, it came down to something about space, like being from the West or Midwest and understanding unoccupied space. Uh, you're from Michigan, do you, do you buy my theory? I do. I do. I mean, I remember sitting in the backyard in a lawn chair, staring up at the sky and feeling like I was in the very center of this immense country. And of course, I wasn't, but I felt that way. And I feel that way when I'm out west, too, that I'm in the middle of something really big. Um, I think it has to do a little bit with this... Um, sense of isolation that you get in the, in, in, in the United States 
that you're part of some destiny, it probably ties in with, um, you know, the, 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 the uh, constitution or something with it. You're part of this vast experiment that's going on. And, um, you know, I feel like when you're alone in America, you're alone in a different way. I'm not sure if it's really true, but I feel like you are because you're alone with a certain history. You're alone with Abraham Lincoln and Rosa Parks. And, you know, uh, I just have this sense that being alone here in this vast continent is a little bit different than being alone, say, in Italy or on the southern shore of Spain or something. Sugi, I wonder, I was going to ask you, you know, you grew up on the East Coast, but now you live in Minneapolis, which is a great city, but I consider Minnesota like one of the loneliest states in America for some reason. Why is that? I don't know. It seems really scary and cold up there. I don't know. It just, uh, but I wonder, do you feel like differently living in the Midwest as opposed to like the East Coast? Yes, I think. Um, well, I've lived in a few different places in the Midwest. I've lived in Ann Arbor and I've lived in Iowa City. And I feel like all of those places had really different cultures. Here there is, I mean, I live in the Twin Cities and I do feel like in certain parts of the Twin Cities, it's, for example, it seems like it's, of course, very easy for us to socially distance. Um, we already had some of the habits, you know, we were in the winter, we go, we go inside and we, we huddle sometimes alone and we are um, reserved. I mean, or I'm not reserved, but sort of the Scandinavian uh, history or all of that sort of, there is like a, a natural, something about the, one of the predominant characters of Minnesota is, seems to be one of a kind of reserve and solitude and self-sufficiency which in some ways I actually also associate with um, writers of New England. But of course, like when you think about things like, you know, Walden, like Walden, you know, oh, I'm alone or whatever. But like, also he well, went to his mom's house and did his laundry. So New England was like the original <laughs> Midwest, you know, before, before, you know, people were, you know, white people at least were living in the Midwest, you know. Right, right. I think yeah. it has Go ahead. Well, I, I think it has to do sort of with what you said, the, you know, the original Midwest or was, was, was the East, um, was Robert Frost territory. It, it kind of has to do with the pioneer thing and um, the stoic spirit that you have to have to survive the long winters. Um, I think the Midwest still has a lot of that. It's only a generation or two away that, they, that um, a lot of people were living in log cabins and struggling to exist. Sure, so, I think of, you know, Laura Ingalls Wilder or something like that, right? Like my ori original notions of Minnesota are from that book. And of course, I don't know, I wonder about like how much this notion of like, I am the American loner is just also, I don't know, an erasure of other communities. Obviously they were here, like at the University of Minnesota, there's a lot of discussion about, right? We're on, we're on native lands, of course, like we're a land grant university. And so the way that that, I don't know. I think that there's also something there about like the American myth of the loner kind of trampling on that history as well. But that's part of the aloneness to know that this crime happened, you know, and it's there, I think. You know? Sure. But don't you think that people also thought that like back in the day, like, oh, I'm out to conquer like this unpopulated land. They were pretending yeah. they were solitary. Right. And, and, the, and it was a, 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 an aloneness that comes out of fear, fear of the other. Um, Different, different chemistry. We're not, we're clearly not going to get to all forms of American solitude in this interview. Uh, but uh, I thought of other forms, you know, there's the solitude caused by gender inequity or violence. You know, I think of Alice Monroe or Toni Morrison. There's a solitude caused by racism. The Colson Whitehead's work seems to be so often about that kind of solitude or, or Gloria Anzaldúa. There's also class and the solitude of class. Um, and I wondered if you could talk about that, the solitude of class, and, and, and may, maybe read to us from the story, Fist Fight, Sacramento, August 1950, to close out. Sure. Um, for me, class is the unspoken, um, unspoken thing in American culture. I mean, it's spoken by academics, and it's spoken by certain writers, but it's not spoken in, uh, in, in a sort of a popular way. And um, I'm always asking when I see a movie, you know, and they live in a really beautiful house, it's a Christmas movie and everybody's happy and there's lots of stuff and be, I'm always like, what, what does this, what did they, what, what did they do to make their money? And I think, <laughs> you know, it's, 
it's a very, um, it's something that we turn away from. In this story, um, I was um, thinking about a friend of mine who, who grew up in, on a ranch out in California and uh, back in the 50s and, and didn't have, was r r you know, relatively poor, but had a lot of um, Oki friends. The fight stayed inside the circle of light from the street lamp. The daytime fight would have no such borders. A daytime fight would move, often move from the back of a bar all the way to the front or into the field or in some cases, depending on those fighting, it would end with a blow of an implement, a scrap of lumber, or a crowbar. Nighttime fights had the formality of the circle surrounded by night wind and cool dark. For a few seconds, as the two fighters stood and swayed, there was a silence that expressed a need for a larger narrative. It wasn't enough, the heir said, to simply fight over the Oki comet. It wasn't enough to have one more sacramental fist fight between a wealthy town boy and a ranch boy. The air begged for deeper significance. Then someone said, kick that fucking silver spoon out of his teeth, Bagheera. And on Sutter's side, someone said, knock the clodhopper's jaw off, clean his yokel clock. While the girls remained silent, there were three or four of them and pitted the elegant beauty of Sutter's dimples and clean jaw against the rough, blunt complexity of Bagheera's face. With the exception of a young woman named Sarah Breland, who worked the fountain at the Five and Dime store in town and had talked with Bagheera once or twice, setting a milkshake in front of him, seeing in his eyes the sophisticated kindness that came from her toil. Knowing, too, talking to him, he spoke carefully, his words barely audible in the din of the store, the cheap of canaries in the pet section, the popcorn machine popping, that he understood a certain type of quiet that came from living on the margins, not only of life, but of the town itself. For she lived in a house not far from his ranch, tending her sisters while her mother went to Sutter's home and to clean. She had gone a number of times to Sutter's house to stand with her mother and watch as she worked the iron press, the starchy steam puffing as she pushed the lever down and made tight creases while her nimble fingers lifted and readjusted. Sarah caught Bagheera's eyes, eye as it swayed over Sutter's shoulder and gave him a slight smile and a nod as if to indicate that a secret might pass between them. Years later, she'd remember the way he had nodded back at her once quickly She'd remember the taste of dust in the air and the scent of juniper. She'd see the significance, the hugeness of that single glance and the luck of having arrived at the tavern, hearing the shouts out back. And for some reason, she liked to think it was her deep sense of pity of wanting to be there to care for those who were beaten, walking around to watch. She liked to think she had been looking for Bagheera, searching him out, but of course that wasn't true. He was just one more ranch boy in a line of many. David, thank you so much. Sure. And thanks for joining us. Um, we want to remind our listeners to go out and pick up instructions for a funeral. Thank you.